Hi, glad to be with you. This is our first lecture in um, the class Biblical Foundations. And we're going to start with a topic that uh, you might not suppose, because as I discussed earlier, this, there's four units of study in this course, hermeneutics, worldview, theology, and ethics. And we're doing hermeneutics, which you recall is the science of biblical interpretation. And, uh, but we're going to start with a topic in this first lecture on bibliology. Now, why would we do that? What is bibliology, first of all? Well, bibliology, uh, we're going to define here as uh, the teaching that we ascertain about the Bible by the Bible. It's what we believe about the Bible. It's the doctrine of the Bible. And so you might ask, why are we starting with that? That doesn't seem like a topic you would cover in hermeneutics. It seems like a topic you would cover in theology or systematic theology. Well, you're right. But it seems to me that this would be a good way to start in order to sort of lay the infrastructure, the theological infrastructure that we need in order to justify or stoke our interest in doing hermeneutics and studying hermeneutics. Perhaps you'll see what I mean as we go along. So we're going to do bibliology, and as I said, that's what we're going to define as uh, what the Bible teaches about itself, what we ascertain about the Bible by the Bible. All right, And so we're going to cover sort of several categories here that I believe that the Bible claims for itself that when we add it all together will constitute a working bibliology for us. And so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the Bible as um, having authority, clarity, necessity, and sufficiency. And if you're curious, this little outline of bibliology comes from a theologian named Wayne Grudem and uh, some other theologians that I have read as well, sort of conglomeration, but the basic outline probably follows his textbook pretty closely. It's a very good textbook for the classroom and perhaps you might want to do some further reading in some of those books. But anyway, we're going to look at those categories. Authority. What do we mean by that? I mean that all the words in the Bible are God's words. That's where we start. We assume that. We make that uh, proclamation, if you will, about the Bible. Well, is that true? I mean, are we just saying that? Or does the Bible actually say that about itself? Because if that's true, then the Bible is our ultimate authority. That's the logical conclusion that we come to. That's the reason why we're saying that the Bible claims for itself authority. Well, let's look at that. In addition to the Jewish uh, people acknowledging throughout history that the Old Testament is Scripture and thus being authoritative, in addition to that, when we read the Old Testament, it seems everywhere uh, that it assumes this, that this is something that just everywhere it assumes about itself. Uh, I could give you lots of different kinds of examples, but let me give you one, for instance. You know, the passages that you encounter in the Old Testament, the many passages that say, or that begin with, thus says the Lord. There's a lot of them. Let me just give you some references. Exodus 4.22, 1 Samuel 10.18, Isaiah 10.24, and the list goes on and on. Well, this is one example of how the Old Testament, in addition to the Jewish people uh, believing this and assuming this, one example of the Old Testament assumes it for itself. But you might say, well, that's great. What about the New Testament, which was written later? What about the New Testament after Christ came and was incarnate? Well, let's think about that. We believe that it also claims the same thing for itself. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, Second Peter, you'll find that Peter refers to another New Testament writer. Who's that? Paul. He refers to Paul and his writings as Scripture. Right? 2 Peter 3.16 is where you can find that. That's very interesting. You know, Paul's no minor mention since he wrote a majority of our New Testament. So we see that in 2 Peter, uh, Peter referring to Paul's writings as Scripture. We also find something else. In 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul says that he is quoting Scripture. He begins this passage in 1 Timothy 5.18. He says he's quoting Scripture. And what does he say? He talks about how that you uh, shall not muzzle an ox so on and so forth, and he goes on to say that the laborer deserves his wages, and so on, in the context of the discussion that he's having. Now, what's interesting about this is that the first part of that is an Old Testament reference. He calls it Scripture. Well, that's no big surprise. But the second part of that is from the New Testament tradition. And so what we have is something very interesting here. We have Paul acknowledging, in the very same context, an Old Testament uh, reference and a New Testament tradition reference 
And both of these things being considered Scripture. Interesting. So it seems like it's fair to assume that the Bible assumes for itself to be the Word of God, that it claims this for itself. So what do we conclude then as a result? We conclude that if this is true, that's we again we'll go to Scripture and see what uh, how Scripture weighs in on this, and so we will. Second Timothy three, Second Timothy three sixteen says that all Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So if Scripture is God breathed, it came from God, then our natural and obvious logical conclusion is that it is authoritative. And so there we have our first point, that um, the Bible, Scripture, is authoritative. That's what it claims for itself. And so what's that next aspect as we're start trying to shape and develop a working bibliology that we were going to discuss? Clarity, if you recall, we were going to look at clarity. So we've got the Bible's authoritative. Now we're looking at clarity. What do we mean by that? We mean that the Bible is not an obscurely written book only for the intellectual elite to understand. What we're saying is, is that the words of the Bible are written in such a way that anyone who desires to know uh, what it means to be reconciled to God, to find salvation, that these things can be readily apprehended in Scripture. You don't have to be a New Testament scholar. You don't have to be an intellectual giant in order to read Scripture and ascertain what it means to be reconciled to God, to find salvation. Now, let me tell you what I don't mean. I do not mean that the Bible is always easy to read. In fact, there are many difficult passages in Scripture. I mean, that's the reason why we would even tackle a course uh, unit like we're doing right now in hermeneutics, where we're trying to learn how to better and rightly understand and interpret our Bibles. Because it's not always easy. It's a difficult thing to do at times. So that's not what I'm trying to say. But what I am saying is, is that For the person who sincerely wants to know what it means to be reconciled to God, to find salvation, to find that way of salvation, the Scripture has great clarity on this. It is not something that you have to be an intellectual giant in order to ascertain. Perhaps Psalms 19.7 is a good reference for you to jot down for that. Okay, so we have the Bible as being authoritative. We have it as uh, having clarity. Now, what is that next category that we're going to look at as we're developing our bibliology? Necessity. Necessity. What do we mean when we say that the Bible claims for itself necessity? Well, what we're trying to say is that in order to know the way of salvation, it is necessary. That's what we're getting at. Now, it is true that we can know that there's a God without Scripture. That's not what I'm getting at. In fact, if you look at Romans 1, 18 through 20, uh, you'll see a whole passage beautifully written by the Apostle Paul talking about how the natural world, the physical world, is a means by which humankind can understand and realize, apprehend that there is a God. And not only that, that we can understand and apprehend certain attributes about God. That's pretty amazing. That's talking about general revelation, something that everyone in every place and every time has always had access to. What we're talking about, obviously, because we're building a bibliology, so we're not talking about the physical world as being a means of communication regarding God. We're talking about special revelation. God uh, being specific about certain things that he desires, that pleases him, things that uh, we need to understand in order to be reconciled to him. In other words, uh, understanding who Christ is and what he accomplished for us and so on and so forth. This comes through Scripture. We need it. It is necessary, this message, whether it be from our reading it, from a preacher preaching it, a missionary carrying the message, maybe even God himself commuting, communicating somehow uh, this message to someone. Uh, I, I mean, God can do this however he wishes. That's not the point. The point is, is that it is necessary. God's special revelation is necessary, and we believe that Scripture claims that even for itself. We look um, in Romans 10, 14 through 17, perhaps would be a way for us to justify a claim such as this. Uh, Paul tells us that faith, which by the way is needed for salvation, comes by hearing the word of God. That's what Paul tells us. So without the word of God, having it communicated to us in some sense, in some way, some manner, 
through some means, uh, salvation is out of reach. We need it. It's necessary. And so we have Scripture, God's Word, as authoritative, as having clarity, and as being necessary. It has necessity. And these are things that it claims for itself. Now, let's look at another category, the final category, in fact, and that is sufficiency. The Bible claims for itself sufficiency. Now, what do we mean by that when we say that, that the Bible is sufficient? We're saying that there's nothing in life that we need as Christians that the Bible does not sufficiently address. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 would be a good reference for that. That's what we're getting at. Now, what do we mean? Do We mean to communicate to you that, uh, let's just say, for instance, that you're trying to decide, uh, you're graduating high school, I want to go to Letourneau or, or Harvard or MIT, and um, I just don't know which. I better, I better get out my Bible, better get my Bible out here and find out which one of these schools that I need to go to. No, that's not what we're saying, because obviously uh, the Bible doesn't address that particular topic. Um, it's just not in there, okay? right? Not specifically, anyway. There are some principles that might help guide us along our way uh, when we're making uh, important decisions in life, obviously. And in fact, that's what I mean. So I'm not trying to say that, uh, that the Bible is specifically going to address everything in life that we need to know. What I am saying, or that we want to know, I should say, it does address everything we need to know. What I am saying, though, is that it is sufficient in order to uh, sort of bring us to a place to inform us in such a way that we can live a successful Christian life, a life that's pleasing to God. There's nothing in Scripture that's left out that we need to know about in order to please God with our lives as Christians. It is sufficient. Okay. And so what are the implications of that? The implications... I would say that we need to not look to other sources and prioritize them over Scripture, things that would uh, sort of be helps to us in this life in, in many instances. I simply don't need to be prioritized over Scripture because Scripture is sufficient in order to help us come to a place where we're living happy, successful lives, pleasing to God. In other words, uh, we wouldn't want to place secular psychology uh, over the Word of God, right? This is something that is helpful to a lot of people, but certainly shouldn't be something that is prioritized over Scripture. What about in religious circles, right? Um, in some religious denominations, you have prophecies, right? Now, this can be a good thing if it's real and it's really from the Lord, but this is not something that ought to be prioritized over God's special revelation, something revealed in His Scripture, because it is sufficient, you see. And so we want to, we want to not prioritize any of those things over Scripture. What about even our own private beliefs? Have you ever noticed how some people will just um, they sort of just have their own sort of way of thinking about life, their own ideas about how things work and how to be uh, successful and happy and you know what God likes and what He does, and they have all these opinions about life, but they've never really bothered to check it to see if it corresponds, if it is consistent with the message of Scripture. Well, you should do that because Scripture is sufficient, and it's authoritative, right? And it has clarity, and it's necessary, and all of these things. And so these are very important things that we want to, uh, that we want to remember, that we want to uh, be thinking about as we begin to form a working bibliology. So if these things are true, then what I'm hoping for you guys is that, um, which, by the way, we do believe they're true as Christians, but what I'm hoping for is that this information will sort of help generate a profound interest in hermeneutics and learning how to rightly interpret your Bible. That's really what my desire is for this first lecture, for you to go, you know what, this is awesome. The Bible is, um, is a really uh, sort of indispensable tool that God has given us as authority, right? That means it's God's Word, and, the re and our obvious conclusion then is that it has ultimate authority over us, that it has clarity. That means that uh, as it regards the way of salvation, it is very clear. You don't have to be a, a, a genius, so to speak. Uh, you don't have to be a biblical scholar in order to apprehend what the Bible has to say about what it means to be reconciled to God. Uh, it has necessity. We need it. In order to understand what it means to be reconciled to God, we need more than general revelation. We need more than 
to be able to look outside and see a beautiful sunset. We need God to be specific and to get into the particulars of what that looks like. And he's done that for us. The Bible is, nece is a necessity. And it is sufficient. It addresses all the areas of our life that, uh, that we need to know in order to live a life pleasing unto God. And so hopefully these things will just inspire you, will just provide you with a, with a profound interest in interpreting God's Word. And so that's what we're going to do with this first unit. This will sort of be a supplement um, to your other assignments that you have there. So please take note of those things. Uh, these lectures will, uh, will hopefully sort of guide you along, supplement your reading, supplement your assignments. And uh, again, if you have any questions, we want to sort of infuse back in this program uh, what you would find in an on-site classroom, that is to say interaction, being able to ask questions, and uh, so forth. So you want to do that in the discussion forum, and uh, we'll be able to also enjoy that aspect of the learning process. All right, guys, thank you so much for your attention, and uh, check for the next lecture. There's a number of them. You'll have to work your way through it. We're blazing through a 15-week course in five weeks, and so that requires a, quite a bit of a commitment on your part, obviously, to pay off if you've done five weeks. So anyway, we'll talk to you guys soon.